You are listening to the Hike Files podcast. I am your host, Kurt Zitzelman. What's going on? If you're watching the video version of this, you can see I'm actually wearing orange this week. How about that? It's a little more natural. This episode, going to talk about 10 hiking and outdoor myths that you may have heard and going to go through why you should probably ignore them. Uh, I do want to say that if you are following the podcast in, on YouTube, but you would rather listen to the podcast somewhere else, I have expanded where the podcast is available. It's now available on Spotify. It's available on Apple Podcasts. It's available on Podcast Addict. It is supposedly available on Google Podcasts, although I can't see it listed anywhere. I'll check again later, but if it's not there yet, it'll be there shortly. Either way, if you have another podcast player you'd like it to be in, and it supports RSS, there's also the RSS feed, and I'll link to all that stuff down in the show notes or the video description, depending on how you're watching this or listening to it. So without any further ado, let's get right into this list. The first one, very pertinent to current weather conditions, is that waterproof gear keeps you bone dry, whether that's rain a jacket and pants or waterproof boots or socks. It helps keep you dry ish, but you still, um, you sweat, you perspire, even if you're just sitting still. And if it's raining, it's going to be humid and that humidity is going to get in that gear. At some point you're going to be damp waterproof gear. There's a trade off where you've got to, um, You've got to, in your mind, decide if you're going to get more wet because of the weather or more wet because of the sweat. And if you're just going to be hot and sweaty in your gear, you might as well just take it off. The best bet is to carry dry clothes with you in a waterproof, watertight, like sealable bag or like a contractor bag or something like that. Keep all your gear in there in your backpack. Keep your gear dry. Because then once you get to camp, you can change out your clothes. You can get in your tent or your hammock or under your tarp or into the shelter or whatever you're going. And then you can stay dry. And then if uh, the, it stops raining, you can have a little fire and you can dry your clothes out. Not in the fire, but by the fire. Number two. <laughs> and this is the one that I always, I always kind of chuckle at. Because um, people seem to believe... Animals are out for blood. Like there's a meeting every morning in the forest and the bears and the the bobcats and the foxes and all the animals get together and they kind of tally up how many people they got the day before and how many people they're going to get the following day. You know, what their plan of attack is to get those pesky humans. Listen, most animals don't give uh, two craps that you're out in the woods. I'm not saying just... um go up and pet them, but unless they're sick or there's something wrong with them, they're probably not going to bother you. Uh, now, obviously, different animals behave different ways, so you've got to really judge by your your region. Like out where I am, we don't have, like the biggest animal we have is a black bear, and black bears generally, yeah, I believe in the last five years, there's been out of tens of thousands of reported bear encounters, reported bear encounters. Now there's plenty that people have bears in their yards or they see them out and about and they never report them. So tens of thousands of reported bear encounters, only two of them came down to physical contact with the bear. Animal attacks are not as common. It mentally, you, you think you're going to get out in the wild and they're just going to come after you. That's generally not the case. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in one of these other myths, but know where you're going know what kind of animals are out there understand what their behaviors are i mean you don't have to become an animal psychiatrist but you know you can do very quick research and see now if i'm in an area where there's going to be grizzly bears i'm going to be a little more cautious um when it's snake season i i pay more attention to you know what in rocky areas or even near rocky areas timber rattlers like to be in the woods but near rocks so they can warm up so you just want to be aware that they're there and then you just if you can't avoid the area where they might be just make yourself known before you get there 
and generally those animals will leave. They'll vacate the area until you go through. But just always be aware of what can be there and just be prepared for it. Number three, you need to spend buku bucks to get started in hiking or camping or anything like that. It's got to be the best of the best. Has to be. That's not true at all. You can get started with what you are wearing right now, unless you are naked, and then you'd have to start hiking at a nudist colony. But still, you don't need a lot of special gear. You might not be super comfortable, and you might not be able to go very far with just what you have, but you can get started, and then you start to learn what you actually need. Uh, I've said this before. Uh, I really do believe in the, the beg, borrow, and get really cheap. Um, to get started when you're new you can ask as many questions as you want but you're still not going to know what you like so only you will be able to determine it there's no sense in going out and spending thousands of dollars on gear to get started only to realize that you don't like it or you don't like that gear you don't you know you've got different ideas of what you should be doing you don't need a, a ton of money and a lot of times you can just get by on the gear that you already have you don't even realize it's gear just go out take some water take some snacks take a map be safe have fun get started and go from there number four is another one that i've heard quite often for hiking for backpacking for kayaking for anything like that and it's that either i'm i am not or i am in the right shape for this there's people who think that just never going to be able to do it. They're not in good enough shape. But there's also people on the flip side who think, oh, look, I go to the gym you know, X amount of times, and I've done this, and I run marathons, and I do that, and I do all this thing. They get on a trail, and they realize it's a different group of muscles. It's a different kind of stamina. You're, you're going. It's just it's completely different than what they're used to doing. And so it doesn't really matter uh, if, you're, if you think you're in too good a shape to do it and it's going to be easy, or if you don't think you're in good enough shape at all, uh, a story that I, I'll share here, and I don't know that I've ever really talked about this in any of the videos, and I might have, but this was a couple of years ago. I was over in Pinchot. I was uh, at Forgotten Camp. I'd gone out for an evening walk, and I was looking for other spots where I could find new campsites, and this car pulls up and stops, and you know the guy's like, well, hey, look, I know you, but you don't know me. And uh, he went on to tell me his name was Gary. He went on to tell me that he was watching my videos and he was watching uh, Syntax 77 uh, because we're both kind of local. Syntax is down by Delaware, I believe. And watching our videos gave him the confidence to go out and start doing this stuff himself. And he said that when he first started watching our videos, he would have a hard time getting up and going from the living room to the kitchen. It was just exhausting for him. And that was like two years prior to him and I meeting. And while he was he was passing me in the forest to go park his car and do like a five or six mile hike so it just it, it took me for, for me to, to soak in that the videos I was doing had helped someone get out and realize that they didn't it, the, you have to start somewhere and he was doing it and it did take a minute for it to set in but it was just evidence that all you really need is a little bit of motivation to get out and start. Start with anything. Just start walking around your yard. Take a walk down the block. Walk to your local park. If you don't start, you'll never start. Unless you've got some serious medical condition where the doctors tell you, um, if you try to do this, you're going to die, then give it a shot. And if you do have some serious medical condition, talk to your doctors and ask them, say, look, I want to start, I want to start hiking. And they're probably going to tell you to start off slow. But if, if they give you the go-ahead, if you've got a serious condition, but they give you the go-ahead to give it a try, I, I've talked to a lot of people who getting outside has changed a lot of things in their lives for the better. And I highly recommend you do it. Do it responsibly. But don't ever feel like you're not capable. Don't be afraid. And people on the trail aren't going to look at you. If, you. if you feel like you're not in the right shape to do it and you go out there, it's not like people are going to look at you and laugh. Most people I know, most people I've met on the trail, if they see people trying, they're going to help. They're not going to hurt. Number five. Oh, this one, this one gets me. This is, 
and this is a, a general myth, this trail or this, this park, this area is maintained so I don't need a map or I can leave my garbage behind because someone's going to pick it up or I can pet this animal because obviously this is a state land so it must be a zoo, it must be safe. No, when you're out hiking, it's wild, it's you. Have a map, have a backup map. Learn how to use a compass. Learn how to use landmarks. Learn how just basic orienteering. You can't just have like zero sense of direction and go drop yourself in woods and think it's going to be okay. Just because a trail is well-maintained and marked where you start doesn't mean that's going to be the case a mile down the trail. As far as it being maintained and leaving your garbage at, let's say, a camp or at a picnic area or anywhere like that, no. Carry it in carry it out if if there's garbage cans there okay put your garbage in the can don't leave your garbage laying on the ground think someone's just gonna come by and get it because that's their job no that is your job you bring stuff in you take your stuff out and then the wildlife part of that yeah sure it's maintained and it's it's state land or it's federal land but the wildlife it's right in the name wildlife is wild they're not going to put up with too much crap from people. So, uh, you know, people get injured by wild animals, usually in a setting. So going back to that, uh, number, th- number, uh, two animals are out for blood. Yeah. Most wild animals are going to leave you alone, but when you get into an area where there's a lot more people and the wildlife starts to get used to those people being there, but then the people start to try to go and interact with the animals. That's when you have animal encounters. And I know I've spoken about this before. When animals get used to humans, that's when bad things start to happen. Number six, and I just had this listed, snacks. <laughs> a lot of my videos I talk about, and I know a couple people who always joke about the fact I'm talking about, oh, you know, we're going to go, we're going to snack, we're going to stop, we're going to eat, because that is very important. If on your normal day you don't eat a lot, or drink a lot of water when you're just at work or at home or doing your normal thing, that's going to be a lot different when you're on the trail. If you're kayaking, if you're camping, if you're hiking, you burn a lot more calories when you're out doing things. You dehydrate a lot faster when you're out doing things. So if you are, you're the kind of person that's like, oh, I don't eat your breakfast and I eat a light lunch and then I don't eat anything until dinner. When you're on a trail, you're going to want breakfast you're going to want a lunch you're going to want snacks even if you don't feel hungry and this is a problem that um like dragon and i had when we first started hiking together we both had the same issue of i don't feel hungry we'll just keep going and then all of a sudden you don't realize your body's kind of masking that hunger because you're trying to make miles and then all of a sudden it's like no we're hungry we're out of fuel and you feel like crap so we start setting like a mileage in time if we get to the mileage first, we'll look at the time. If we're still okay, we'll go to the time limit, and then that's as far as we'll go, then we stop. But if we get to the mileage, or we get to the time, whichever one we get to first, if we're hungry, we're going to stop. If we're okay, we're going to go to that second point, and then we're going to stop, regardless of whether we feel like we're hungry. Because as soon as we stop and we start making food, all of a sudden we realize how hungry we really are. So take food with you. Um, take a lot of water with you. Stay keep your calories up, keep hydrated. Even in the winter, you think, oh, winter, I'm not going to sweat. I'm not going to dehydrate. I don't want to stop and get cold to make food. You are the furnace. So in the winter, everything you eat is fuel to that fire, which keeps you warm. So stopping to eat actually helps keep you warm longer, especially overnight. You get up you know, in the winter, if you're camping and you get up to, to pee, Eat something, snack on something, get back. It'll help keep you warm. It helps your warmth get trapped by your gear, by your insulation. And then water, you'd be surprised how fast you can dehydrate in the winter because the air is generally drier, which means you don't realize you're sweating. It just immediately evaporates and it just pulls the moisture right out of you and you dehydrate. So hydration and snacking any time of year, very important. Number seven, first aid, and I'm safe. As long as I got a first aid kit with me, I'm safe. You will learn that, yes, you do use your first aid occasionally on the trail. You hope you don't have to use it very often. 
But more often than not, your first aid kit is to assist others. Just because you have first aid doesn't necessarily mean you're safe. A few years ago, when I, I went down on the rocks on the AT, it wasn't my first aid kit that bandaged me up. It was the group I was with who immediately, as soon as I went down, their first aid kits came out, and I didn't even know what was going on. Like I, I mean, I knew what was going on, but like they were like right on the ball, and they kind of pulled their, their kits together and, and bandaged me up, and I, I was able to keep going. Just because you may not think you need something, I'm not saying take everything, but maybe carry some stuff. So just in case you come across someone who has fallen or someone who has gotten bitten by a snake or something like that, and you can render assistance. So first aid kit, not so much for for you, it is, but not so much for you, more for other people. And it doesn't, it's first aid, it's not um, hospital quality care. You're getting yourself out of the forest. You're getting yourself out of the, of the dangerous situation. So don't be lulled into a false sense of security with first aid. Absolutely take it with you. But it's j literally just a Band-Aid. Number eight, solo is a no-go. Like, never go out alone. I hear a lot of people say this. Never go out alone. It's dangerous. You're going to disappear. You're going to get attacked by something. It's You shouldn't do it. I will say that solo is not for everybody. If you're doing a solo day hike and you're in a state park, you're probably not alone. There's a lot of people around. If you're doing solo backpacking, that can be a different story. And you've got to be comfortable with that. There's a lot of things you have to be comfortable with to do a solo backpacking trip. Especially if you're going somewhere that is remote. I love going to remote areas and going solo, but I'm comfortable with my ability to get myself out of situations, to not get myself into situations that are dangerous, to listen to my body. When my body says it's time to stop, I stop. If my body says it's time to bail, I'll bail. I'm a little more likely to push myself solo, but I know when it's time to stop, it's time to stop. You've just got to be comfortable with being able to make those decisions on your own. You got to be comfortable being able to keep yourself motivated to do, if it's a long trip, you're the only one that's going to be able to keep you motivated. You got to be comfortable with being in your own head. And some people just aren't. You got to be comfortable with being solo at night when there's no other people and there's animals around. So it comes back to a lot of things on this list. So if you are comfortable with doing it, then by all means, give it a try. Always let someone know where you're going. Let them know what your general plan is. Let them know when you, you plan on being back, where you're going to park. Even when you're solo, with as connected as the world is today, you're never really alone out there. Number nine, miles, miles, miles. You've got to do as many miles as you possibly can and get the hike done as quickly as possible. So if you're doing something long like, like the, the, the AT or the, the Continental Divide Trail, Pacific Crest Trail, any of those, doing something that's long, you're going to want to keep your miles up as much as you can. But if you're just out for a day hike or you're out for a couple of days and you know, you know, that how long the trail is, if you want to go out and do two miles and then set up camp, do it. <laughs> there's, there's no law that says that you, you are only, uh, it's only considered hiking or backpacking. If you do X amount of miles, do what you want to do. If you're hiking, like there's there's been trips where I've been hiking. I'm like, I'm going to go to this point just because I know how many days I have and how far I have to go. I'm going to go to this campsite or to this area and find camp. And then a mile or two or three before I get to that campsite, I see a campsite that just like pops out at me. And I'm like, oh, nope, I'm going to stop here. Or weather might stop you. If the trail's 16 miles and you get to four and you say, okay, well, I don't want to do the rest of those miles. You can just turn around and go back do what you're comfortable with the, the term a lot of people use is hike your own hike if you want to do short miles over more days or just short miles in general go for it uh, and then number 10 you just are never going to be able to hike if you're afraid of certain things right if you're afraid of the dark if you're afraid of heights how are you going to hike a mountain if you're afraid of heights are you afraid of water? You're afraid of snakes. You're afraid of whatever. Don't let those things 
keep you from going out and experiencing the outdoors or anything in your life. I have a, some, a near crippling fear of heights sometimes. Um, I keep it pretty well under check. There's certain circumstances where I can just completely kind of turn it off. But at other times, um, it's stopped me right in my tracks. Uh, I did a video on it. I'll link it down in the show notes in the, in the video description. If you're watching the video, if you want to watch that video, it was a test hike that dragon and I were doing. We both had kind of, our backs were kind of in bad shape and we had a trip up to the Adirondacks coming up. So we decided let's do a test hike on like a nice rocky terrain that we know will be similar to what we're going to do in the, in the Adirondacks. And if we can do this, then our back should be okay for up there. And it was a section of the Appalachian Trail, uh, northbound out of uh, Lehigh Gap. You go up this open side of the mountain, and it's all boulders. It's very steep. And it's exposed. And that that's it's like the worst thing for me. When I'm out, and there's like this exposure, and I can see the drop-off around me. And I can kind of feel it behind me. And it started to kick in. And one of the rocks I went to go up and over, like you had to kind of, like if you're watching the video, like you had to kind of come out and around the rock. And it wasn't much. It, it's not, most people might not even perceive that outward kind of move you got to make. But when that fear height starts to kick in, it just amplifies that. And I had to sit down. I had to find a spot where there was, like a tree in front of me and a rock behind me somewhere where I could kind of block out that openness and calm myself down. And it's real. I mean, it's, I, I, it seems bizarre. People who don't have that kind of a fear, you just, you don't understand it. Sometimes you look and go, what are you, what are you afraid of? Like, it's just a rock. Just climb up. You're not going to fall that far. That's it's irrational. That's why it's an irrational fear. It's not about what is actually going on. It's what you perceive and it can stop you dead in your tracks. Um, there are ways that you can get beyond those things. If you, if it's, um, I know people who don't don't like snakes. They won't hike in weather when there's a high probability of being snakes. They won't hike in areas where there's a high probability of being snakes. Um, you just keep. If you can keep yourself out of that situation, then you're best off. But you also want to. Uh, at least I do. I want to kind of push myself beyond it and maybe maybe i'm weird in that way um but i will put myself in those situations where i know uh i may get that fear that that creeps in because i want to try to overcome it and if i can fight past that and get through that that section of trail um then it's like a little victory for me that may not be for everybody but know that there are people out there that know what you're going through if you've got a fear of anything if you're like said anything that might be related to the outdoors there are people out there who know what you're going through and maybe it'll help you through that mind state or give you ideas of how to get around it don't let that stop you and that's my 10 myths of outdoors and hiking and backpacking i hope uh, you guys enjoyed this Again, if you've got any, um, if you want to be a guest on the show, let me know at hike.files at gmail.com. Um, I am putting up the, the site, hikefiles.com, so there'll be a contact link on that page as well. Um, hope you guys are liking the podcast. Fridays, noon is when I'm going to be putting them out. That's the, the schedule I'm kind of shooting for. And if you if your podcast player doesn't show you the artwork, at least... Um, go in and try to find it and, and check it out because I've been, I've been using AI generated artwork and some of it's kind of cool. Last week's was a Bigfoot in a kayak. <laughs> I think it turned out really cool. So check this stuff out. Let me know what you think. Uh, comment and uh, send me emails. Let me know what you guys are thinking of the podcast. I appreciate you listening. Um, that's going to do it for this one. And I will talk to you in the next. <laughs>